Uh, one of the most amazing things about building in crypto is how global, of it, how global it is. Many of you here, myself included, flew thousands of miles to be here and participate in Friends Day and DEF CON. That's why I'm personally excited for this, pan for this upcoming panel. We have our moderator, Annabelle from Amber, and our three panelists, Gabby from YGG, Tasha from Init Finance, and Matthew from Etherscan, here to share their perspectives as builders in Southeast Asia. Please join me in welcoming our next panel, How to Build Successful Web3 Products for a Global User Base. All right, good afternoon. Thank you for, for coming. Thank you for ENS for putting this together. I've been looking forward to this panel for quite some time. Um, it's rare to have a very global audience, but have a panelist that's uh, very familiar with the Asia, uh, both DeFi, GameFi, infrastructure side. Um, so very excited to bring to you guys this panel. Um, before we dive in, just wanted to do a quick round of intro. Uh, so starting with myself, uh, my name is Annabelle Huang, uh, used, uh, formerly the managing partner at Amber Group, uh, recently transitioned to build something new, so excited to be sharing that a little bit later, but today the focus is on, on my fellow, uh, fellow panelists, so maybe we'll start with Gabby. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Gabby Dizon, co-founder of Yield Guild Games, or YGG. We aggregate player communities into guilds and then teach them concepts of Web3 so that they can play games and then earn and own their own digital assets. Hi, my name is Tasha, also a local here uh, in Thailand, uh, founder and CEO of Infinite, which is a DeFi abstraction layer. Abstracts a lot of complexities to get new DeFi applications built, scaled across different chains. Um, previously, I also founded a project called Alpha Finance, which builds a lot of DeFi products. Uh, the most notable one is called Alpha Homora. So I've been building in DeFi and you know, DeFi infrastructure for about four or five years now, uh, based here in Thailand. Hi, my name is uh, Matthew, and I'm the uh, CEO and founder of Etherscan. Uh, and so we've been building the space since uh, 2015 uh, with the mission of bringing equitable blockchain data access to the masses. And coincidentally, we're also one of the earliest supporters of uh, ENS since 2017. Thank you. All right, uh, we don't have that much time today, so we'll just dive right in. Um, First of all, I wanted to start with setting the stage and talk about the Asia landscape in, in general. You guys see a lot firsthand in terms of user behavior, user statistics. Um, so before you know, we dive into the, to the global applications, wanted to focus on the Asia landscape first, um, specifically how, how do user behaviors d differ in different regions in Asia? Because um, I think we often talk about Asia as a whole, but um, in reality, there's so many different regions. If you look at Korea versus Japan versus Greater China or the rest of Southeast Asia. Um, and you know, today we have uh, panelists based in Philippines, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore. So uh, maybe we start with um, Gabby also to talk sure. about the user behavior. So we'll start with the Philippines. Philippines is, has a population of around 110 million. I think there's actually over one mobile device per person. So uh, everybody is mobile, everybody's online on the internet. There's a very strong culture of like freelancing, looking for extra ways to earn money. Um, Philippines is also home to a lot of like service call centers, outsourcing around almost 10% of the GDP is based on a lot of that like outsourced services. And uh, almost 10%, around 10 million people around the world are working all, all across the world. A lot of them in service jobs, if you are in America, parts of Western Europe, or even around like Singapore, Southeast Asia, you see a lot of Filipinos. So uh, one of our largest businesses uh, globally is remittances. So I think Philippines does around, I think something like three billion, three to four billion a month of remittances from wherever they are back to the Philippines. And this is where Philippines actually started with crypto, like how, 
lowering the cost of uh, remittances, getting it more cheaply to people in the Philippines. And uh, where we came in was that uh, with play to earn and uh, people earning, uh, earning crypto through playing games, starting with Axie Infinity in 2020, which is something that rose organically from the community during COVID. It was actually something that did not, was not started by either the Axie team or our, ourselves. Like people were looking for ways to, to earn money playing games. And uh, yeah, it just happened organically. And we were able to kind of harness that into a platform where people could play together, do things together online, and uh, just uh, find a way to earn their own crypto assets. So there's still very strong elements of that, like how can people earn, whether you know, it's, uh, it's from playing games, maybe minting or flip, flipping NFTs, creating art, or doing things around the crypto e ecosystem that are useful. A lot of the people manning your discords as community managers come from the Philippines as well because they speak good, good English chronically online. And yeah, that's what we, we see a lot in the Philippines. Yeah, so I think um, before jumping directly to Thailand, maybe just a quick overview of like Asia as well. Um, I would say Korea is very trading focused, uh, not so much like DeFi usage as well. Uh, I think a lot of uh, things that happen with Terra also like turn a lot of people away fr uh, you know, from DeFi. Um, Japan is more, in my opinion, is more um, uh, like NFT community per se and more entertainment. Um, not so much DeFi, not so much trading uh, because of what happened with their uh, early days in the exchange and they like closed down the exchanges. Um, China, as we know, you know, pretty much you know, a lot of things that so you're building, adopting, trading, uh, and people are also like everywhere because of the regulations in China. I think Southeast Asia is actually pretty segregated. Like it's one region, but each country is so unique because of the local language as well. Particularly in Thailand, uh, DeFi is actually very well adopted. Uh, there was one time in 2020 and 2021 where number one region uh, contributing and actively using PancakeSwap is actually Thai. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of um, yeah, a lot of people are just trying to find ways to earn more money, similar to what you know Gabby was saying. Um, and and you know with the rise of DeFi summer in 20, that's how Thai people got into crypto. So I think that's why a lot of Thai people are now actually like pretty active on chain because of how they got introduced to crypto is pretty hard, like through DeFi. Um, so you know other things that they have continued to do seem you know a lot easier than DeFi. Um, personally, in my opinion, you know Vietnam is more like GameFi, uh, more 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 on like. Uh, building different games or different apps uh, related to the gaming ecosystem. Uh, you know, Malaysia, Philippines, uh, these two can also share more. Yeah. So I think uh, pretty much covers most of the stuff. Uh, in, in general, to, uh, it's, it's the same. Uh, I, the two main use cases uh, that we are looking at are actually more on uh, remittance uh, and also as a way to earn money. So I think it goes down to that financial aspect. Uh, people want an, an opportunity to improve their lives. So w one of the ways to do it is to, to crypto. To, for, for a lot of folks, uh, that's something that they can access directly. Uh, and uh, I, I know of, of many cases of where crypto has, has changed lives of, of a lot of people. Yeah. Makes sense. So I wanted to dive a little be, uh, bit deeper into the different, um, different sectors, different categories. Um, and maybe we'll start with you, Matt, this time to, um, it's interesting, I think in, in KL, in Malaysia, um, we have you guys, EtherScan, CoinGecko as well, actually building infrastructure and not just servicing um, the Asia users, but also global. Um, so maybe you can share a little bit inside of that and then we can go into DeFi and, and GameFi after as well. Yeah, so uh, for, so you, so like for us and likely uh, CoinGecko, right? Uh, and I know that's, uh, the, the reason we kind of chose that data part was that I think the, on the DeFi portion, there were a lot of like, uh, re regulatory un uh, uncertainties. So it wasn't that easy to navigate that portion. And I think having said that, when it comes to data and blockchain, right, uh, it's an equal playing field. Uh, it doesn't really matter where you are. Uh, you, know, you can build it out from Timbuktu and stuff like that. Uh, the data is accessible, it's open source, it's available. Uh, so, which is one of the reasons that I think you have like kind of strong data players coming out from that region. Yeah, Tasha, yeah. For, for your perspective on DeFi maybe? Yeah, as mentioned, um, you know, I think 
uh, DeFi users are, are pretty active here. Um, and naturally, I was one of them as well. Uh, early in 2019, I like, used different DeFi products. Um, and then naturally kind of started building different DeFi ideas that we have in 2020. Uh, I think one, maybe good or bad, I'm not sure, but one thing about Thailand is that it's a bit, on, on the regulator side or on the government side, they move a bit slow. Um, so, so as a result, uh, as a builder, I was actually, or you know, a lot of other builders and other DeFi builders here um, feel somewhat okay to build DeFi here because we feel like if they're gonna put any regulations here, that probably gonna happen in Singapore first or like in somewhere else first, and we will probably know what kind of reg regulations those are gonna be, and we can kind of adapt before you know government here moves. Um, yeah, so I think uh, ha you know counterpoint to 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 uh, you know uh, Malaysia, then I think you know regulations is a bit friendlier here. Uh, banks here, commercial banks here actually like invest in crypto. Like they have like commercial arm, uh, corporate venture arm investing in like tokens, investing in equity of like different uh, blockchain companies. Uh, so they're more you know, forward thinking and, and a bit more open uh, until something happened. Uh, for example, like 3AC or Terra, then you know, they start to have more regulations, yeah. Yeah, so Philippines, what makes it unique is that it's probably one of the most uh, on-chain countries in the world. There's somewhere between 10 to 20 million MetaMask wallets. There's a couple of million Ronin wallets as well. So, uh, of course, a lot of people are onboarded via like Binance before it was banned, but I think people are really looking for stuff to do on-chain. Also, the freelance economy means that a lot of people like to get paid in, in USDC. Um, so, yeah, so it's very rich in terms of just uh, building, uh, bootstrapping an initial user base for on-chain users. Well, actually, um, expanding outside of the Philippines, I know YGG also had, you know, YGG Japan, Southeast Asia, uh, maybe other other areas. Do you see any use difference in, in these regions for, for yeah, you so guys? Th I would say that the major regions we cover are Southeast Asia, India, and LATAM. Of course, a lot of similar elements in that there's a lot of people who are looking to make money either playing games or doing things uh, on-chain. There are a lot of differences in terms of what the landscape looks like, um, how you off-ramp, what applications people prefer. But I would say that the general uh, like characteristics are the same across a lot of these uh, um, emerging markets. Uh, people want to be on-chain. They want to find opportunities to do so in the global market and not be arbitraged by how much you paid by where you're living, right? Makes sense. Well, it uh, feels like the, the use cases are pretty, pretty similar, you know, being able to easily get on chain to either trade or to play games or, or earn in, in some, some ways. So extrapolating that from, I guess, Asia to looking at the, the global um, audience or, or the infrastructure side, what are some of the key technical um, issues or, or, or bottlenecks so far before we can actually bring more adaption, adoption? I know this is sort of the question that's been asked for, for many years, but. <laughs> well, I can start. Um, I think, you know, if you zoom out of things, I feel like uh, adoption happens when things are so simple and, you know, widely accepted. And in order to get there, infrastructure has to be ready. So, you know, you cannot get internet so widely adopted if, you know, every browser requires different usages or different tools to use or different interaction and people are so confused. So I feel like it has to start from like bottom up where infrastructure is ready, uh, more clear on like what chains are going to be the, the mainly adopted one as opposed to, like, you know, millions of chains. Um, and then as each layer gets more clear on, on, on like, you know, how the infrastructure is going to be, then the next layer, the middleware is going to be more clear. Okay, which infra do we have to work with? You know, what kind of interactions do we need to simplify? Because there are only like these five interactions instead of like 100 interactions, right? And then you kind of move up one level at a time to the end users that, okay, these are the things that you're going to do on chain. These are how you can do it. Uh, and you abstract those away. So I feel like we're at the interjection or like intersection where a lot of builders are still building the infra. You know, more use, and we're also expecting more uses to come where a lot of things are not, you know, finalized or like settled yet. So I think it's just a matter of time where each cycle we will see who's gonna, you know, get adopted more and more and which chain or which infra or which D apps gonna, gonna last. And then those who kind of cultivate the culture and usage and activities that normally people would do on chain. Um, and over time, then those would get integrated more into um, 
I would say like user abstraction applications where people don't have to interact directly with the with the app. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Although um, I would say there's probably more abstraction abstraction infra than there is for for apps or or users these days. So. I don't know, Matt, have any hot takes on this? Yeah, so uh, from a technical perspective, I guess it depends on the blockchain, right? Uh, so you, when you're talking about blockchains, there are like two broad categories. You have the monolith blockchains like Solana, where everything's on one place. And then you have modular blockchains like Ethereum, right? So with uh, modular blockchains, you have different layers. And the one of the way to scale it up is through uh, different L2s and rollups. But that obviously introduces another issue, which is uh, fragmentation. Uh, so I, at this point in time, as a user uh, and navigating the blockchains, can can get kind of a little bit tricky uh, in the sense that you know, you're not too sure sometimes on which blockchain you're supposed to go on. So like what Tasha has mentioned, I think uh, a lot of this can be solved through uh, abstraction. And I know a lot of te teams are actually working on it to, to provide a more seamless user experience. And hopefully, we will be able to get there, while also maintaining a certain level of uh, decentralization. Um, actually, just a quick add-on to that, because we were chatting about it earlier, right, that the cost to actually run infra to support all these different chains. So just curious, you know, within the, the Ethereum camp versus other, um, other uh, L1s, mm. what, what does that look like for builders and also for, for users? Yeah, so uh, it's extremely expensive. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so we, we run many different nodes and we're doing it for many years. Uh, it, it only get more expensive. Uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, state road. So, you know, it's, it's a ledger of ledger, right? So anything gets compiled, you can't just drop it off. So it will only get more expensive as time goes on. Bar. So uh, that's where you have hopefully other things that might come into place to manage that state road. Uh, but we, without putting a, a, a number down, it's expensive, it's probably half the operating cost. Just in fair alone. Yeah, Gabby, anything to add? Yeah, one way to think about YUG is that we are like app layer infrastructure, I would say, or one way to think about it is that we're sort of a Web3 native ad or engagement network. We aggregate users and then we work with different applications to bring them those users in the form of you know, questing and guild aggregation. And uh, yeah, I think the app player definitely has a ways to go. Uh, I, I do think that we need a kind of reimagining of what actually does a Web3 native application look like? Is it going to look like uh, Instagram or a TikTok with Web3 Rails? Or it, does it enable new actions because of the primitives that uh, you can do? You can see this with like newer types of applications like pump.fun or yeah, on what does like for example Web3 social look like? This is there's I think there's a lot of experimentation that's going on. That's great, and yeah, for us we see that a lot of the app layer infra, including like user engagement, is just things that uh, have been building, waiting for this moment. So, to to Tasha's point, right? I think there are uh, definitely a lot of builders within infra, but you cannot have that disconnect to the end users. So it sounds like most of the technical challenges is actually around the abstraction part. So um, I, I don't know if for, for each of you, maybe there's anything in, in the roadmap, how you're addressing um, the UI UX towards the end users and, and the abstraction front. Uh, yeah, so uh, the team is multi-chain. So it is here, right? So And so that comes like, like for us, right, uh, one of the ways we want to do it is like you have like 30 diff different explorers. Maybe you shouldn't be going to 30 different explorers. You should be going to one explorer. So uh, our challenge is how do you put that into a single interface and allow the user to navigate 30 different chains or 40 different chains at the same time by using a single, in single inter interface. Uh, so that's something that we're working on. So I think it's the same for any other front-facing apps, right? Uh, you want to abstract that layer away. Yeah. But is it going to happen through, I guess, you know, you guys expand into other ch um, chains or areas, or is it going to be through some sort of um, almost like M&A or those type of um, activities to consolidate? Uh, 
So I think within the EVM chain, it's quite, it's quite fairly straightforward. So I guess if you're looking outside of EVM, then yeah, it's, that's a possibility. Yeah. I think for us, uh, right now we focus on abstracting complexities to build and to scale DeFi protocols, not, not to the level of user end yet, but that's actually our end goal, to not just abstract uh, complexities upon like developers to build and scale DeFi protocols, but you know our ultimate goal is that if we can power uh, a number of DeFi protocols such that we actually control, well not control, we have a unifying uh, layer and, and, and way to interact with these DeFi protocols that are already powered by Infinite, then there is a common language and common instructions that we can actually engineer on the user's end. So w which particular uh, touch point that users face on those applications that are powered by Infinite, then we, we would be able to you know, have an easier time to abstract those complexities away. So ultimately, that's the end goal where we can extend uh, you know, from what we're doing to, uh, to the end user's end. Yeah. Yeah, for us, we're creating a new primitive that allows groups of people to be able to do things together and own assets together on chain. So, uh, yeah, we want we want the kind of the experience of interacting with Web three to to be more multiplayer to, to be able to do things together. And yeah, perhaps we can bring more people on chain that way. Just a follow up there too, also f to the rest of you guys. So. Um, Given everything you've built so far, are there anything that you, on the infrastructure side, that you wish someone is building or um, that, that could help whatever you guys are building, if that makes sense? <laughs> yeah, group identity and reputation primitive. And I'm looking at Kathy while, uh, while I'm saying this. <laughs> yeah, that's something that we'd really like to work on. I think for us, it's actually on like bridging side. Uh, because right now, like we work a lot with different DeFi protocols, abstracting complexities for those. But a lot of time comes down to like, hey, like, is there you know the one bridge that Infinite like prefers or like, you know, chooses for them because they themselves don't want to bear that cost of like, um, you know, making that decision of like which bridge to use. Because I think at, at the end of the time, uh, at the end of the day, like if anything happens, then everyone's asking like who takes the responsibility, whether it's the bridge or like the one who decides to use this bridge. So I think um, you know, having a more secure bridge uh, in a decentralized way uh, would be you know, something that, that would really help us, yeah. Makes sense, although I think most people, myself included sometimes, to use uh, sort of Binance of the likes for bridging, right? Because <laughs> otherwise the, the security is difficult to, to guarantee. Have you looked at any alternatives to, to bridges to in terms of interoperability or, or cross-chain side? Yeah, we're freaking out and we haven't seen anything that is something that we want to use, so we might actually build our own. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah. Um, for, for us, because we index a lot, a lot of data, so I think it's uh, in the ideal world, we have uh, similar standards across different chains. Uh, so uh, the best example of like what has been done right in the past is like you have the ERC20 standards, ERC721. So it's actually kind of easy to navigate across different chains where you have standards. So hopefully going forward, uh, without whatever all, all of your building has like similar standards, and uh, it's actually kind of difficult to get everyone to agree. Uh, but no, it, if it is, then it definitely makes it easier for uh, folks that are building around data. And I guess to to. For, for the data standard, like how, mm. which level does it have to, to become standardized and does it need, what kind of buy-in does it need from the industry? Yeah, so I think uh, with Ethereum, then you have the EIP process, uh, the ERCs, right? So that kind of helps. Uh, but then again, at the end, it's up to the individual projects to adopt it or not adopt it. Uh, but having standards is definitely one way going, going about it. Okay, um, so for the last section of the panel today, um, I think we can maybe look ahead to, to the future trends. Um, again, I think we had a big week last week following the election, market in some sort of you know, new euphoria right now. Um, but wanted to hear from, from your perspective, uh, you know, what are the most uh, exciting trend to, to you and, uh, and what you're building towards? Okay, I'll, I'll cover games specifically because that's the thing I look at all day. Um, I think the products have been getting better in the last couple of years. It takes maybe two, three, four years to make a really good game, and then you have to put in the Web3 elements, then you have to release it. 
Um, and the products have just gotten a lot better. So just having really engaging games that have virtual economies around them that people can own is something that I'm very excited for next year. Yeah, I think if he focuses on game, then I'll focus a bit more on DeFi. I think uh, one thing that I really admire, you know, incumbent projects, let's say Uniswap, Aave, uh, is that you know they can actually have a easier life if they focus more on chain. You know, but they actually decide not to, and they decide to kind of work more with you know trying to get uh, more liquidity or like new liquidity to get on chain, whether it's you know from CFI or like TradFi. Um, so, so I, I think you know we'll definitely see more of new liquidity coming on chain, um, not just from like exchanges uh, and trading, but also and, and like through Dex. But I think it's going to be more like actually using different apps on chain through these incumbent projects at first. But then over time, it would kind of trickle down to other you know DeFi protocols, uh, DeFi infrastructure that would get more adopted as well. So, so we have uh, gaming, we have DeFi, and on my end, it's more on AI. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I don't know what the future holds, but uh, personally, I am excited on the, the possibilities and uh, like what, what would it look like, right? Especially when it comes to crypto and AI. Uh, we've seen uh, recently with a lot of uh, projects coming out saying that they have, you know, uh, it's not a token that we launch, you know, it's, a, it's an AI bot and stuff like that. I, I don't know to what extent if it's a real AI or if it's just someone executing something in the back. But having said that, I think that is endless, op endless opportunities and challenges. Uh, so, like, personally, I'm just excited about that area uh, and to see how that intersects, not, not only from a data perspective, but like, you know, like, uh, uh, it, it, I guess it, it goes down against to uh, identity, you know, like with AI right now, how, how do you authenticate someone? So I guess that's where uh, blockchains might play a role. Uh, and uh, just like a lot of things that I can't think of right now <laughs> or even imagine. Have you guys looked at AI actually? I'm sure you, you have as well. It's impossible not to come across AI now in everything that you see, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and a lot of AI agents now. <laughs> but like, are, are those real, real agents or? Uh? I think we're going to need another panel to, to discuss that. <laughs> um, okay, I think we have maybe like a few minutes left. I don't know if there's any questions from, from the audience, given that we do have, you know, sort of the Asia experts um, on stage today. Don't be shy. <laughs> All right, if there's none, maybe we just uh, leave it with uh, one last question, you know, sort of, um, yeah, we talk about, you know, things that you're most excited about, but uh, for YGG, you know, for Infinite and for Etherscan, what's the m most important um, product update um, that we should look forward to? Okay, so for YGG, it's on-chain guild, so it's a new group primitive that can get people to do things together and own assets together on-chain, and... We're actually announcing that at our event in Manila next week, so you hear it here, here first. Uh, TLDR on Infinite, we abstract a lot of complexities away for builders to build DeFi to scale existing DeFi protocols. Uh, currently working with a number of projects like Pendo, Athena, and also like smaller and newer projects across EVM-compatible chains. Uh, the value that we have been facilitating through different applications that we power include about 1.1 billion uh, US dollars. Uh, the next update is that we uh, just made it so that we can integrate a new chain in about five minutes. Um, so now we're going to be, you know, explosively, uh, you know, working and getting a lot more customers, a lot more apps uh, on all, you know, chains that we work with. Yeah, so on, on our end, it, it's uh, the multi-chain focus. Uh, so one of the things that we recently launched was uh, this, like, uh, multi-chain API, where in, in the past you had to create 30, 40 different keys. Right now, it's just one API key, and that allows you to access all that 50 different chain IDs that we support. Uh, on the other end portion, uh, we're also experimenting with this feature that we call Etherscan Cards that allows you to do some sort of, uh, uh, like, even games and stuff using Etherscan. Yeah, it's a whole different topic. Yeah. All right, well, thank you guys today for your, for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Today.